Well, here we are on the third day of a new year. 2020 was a strange year, but it's over now. We can finally move on and look forward to the hope that is a new year and hopefully a better year ahead. And at this time of the year, I am reminded of New Year's resolutions. We often start the year wishing for a better year ahead, but seldom do we actually resolve to make the changes in our lives that are necessary to result in a better year. So today we're going to talk about the most important area in our lives, our relationship with God. And we're going to discuss how practically to make a resolution to spend more time with God and for it to be more effective than it has in the year that has just gone by. So we're continuing in the book of Psalms today, in the fifth Psalm. Now, David is the author, and he's known as a man with a heart after God. And why is that? We see it so often in his Psalms, because he always has his heart turned towards God. Whenever he's messed up, whenever he's in need of help, he always turns his heart toward God. Even when he's failed to live up to God's standards, he always returns and asks God to show him a better way. And he's a great example for us today because of this. You may have feel, feel like last year you didn't give God enough of yourself and you desire this year to make a change or you just had a hard time and you want to look forward to a good year ahead and you want to know how to make that year ahead a better year. In a moment we're going to read this fifth psalm and then we're going to talk about two areas that we can learn from the example of David, worship and meditation. So today, as we go through this chapter, I want to encourage you to open up your heart to God and to allow him to speak. Think about how you can put into action some of the ideas that we're going to discuss so that you can live a life that is known as having a heart after God. So with that as an introduction today, let's read Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my God, my King, for to you do I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful person. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels because of the abundance of their transgressions. Cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. You see, the Psalms are known as the hymn book of God's people. They cover a range of different topics and themes and were written over a period of over five centuries by many different authors. They range from a hymns of praise to laments, from ceremonial to thanksgiving psalms. They're a wonderful tool for any moment when you want to reach out to God and you just don't have the words to say. Kind of like the gift of tongues is for some New Testament Christians. A prayer language, a way that we can put into words what we express internally but don't know how to put into words, to reach out to God. And so today at the start of a new year we come to Psalm 5. The author is David who is again seeking God's protection from his enemies. And it's interesting to note how many of his Psalms have this theme. And it just goes to show that when we're struggling, the same answer that we find in all of these Psalms is the same answer for us. Turn to God and cry out to him and ask him for the answer. 2020 was a tough year, and I'm sure all of you are looking forward to a new one. But each year has its own struggles. And so at the beginning of this year, we want to start it off right. And one re resolution I made about halfway through last year was to never take my foot off the accelerator. And I've shared with you recently about how I felt like life was mounting up before me like a giant wave. And how when you're crossing a sandbar in a boat, 
the most dangerous thing you can do is to turn around and try and flee from a mounting wave. The only way through is to put the throttle down and hit it head on and as you come over and smash a few times it can hurt tremendously at the time but eventually you get past the breakers and all is open calm seas and plain sailing for a while. And I haven't always been able to live up to that resolution but I feel so much better for having made that resolution part of the way through last year. And you may recall some time ago a message that I shared about living life 100%. I watched a YouTube video which talked about going at 100% rather than 90%. And it's so much easier to go with 100% commitment than 90% commitment and constantly be wondering whether you've made the right decision and, and all of that. And that's so true, that nagging thought of whether or not to continue to commit to something is the undoing of many people's lives. It ruins marriages, it, helps, it makes people settle for less than the best and it leaves people regretting having never taken that leap of faith, letting fear rule instead. And another way to think of it is this. Some of you may ride on a jet ski or a boat over summer. Now if you're in a car and you take your foot off the accelerator, you can still steer with your wheels. But with a jet ski, if you turn off the power, you will lose all steering. If you find yourself headed for the rocks or for another jet ski or for a wharf or a jetty, never take your hand off the throttle. The only way is to turn from the obstacle ahead of you and to power your way out of there. And it's the same in life. Often we can think, ah, it's the holidays, we're finally here. I can't wait for a break from my routine. And we take a break from everything, not just from work, but from God and everything else as well. But the only way to make 2021 better than 2020 is to make that commitment right from the outset to spend the whole year with God, including these holidays. Only a relationship with God will give you the strength and guidance you need to get through the year ahead. And this psalm, Psalm 5, is known as a morning psalm because it takes place in the morning during what you could, I guess, call David's quiet time with God. And he cries out to God in verses 1 to 3. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my God and my King. For to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. And it's a great reminder to us at the start of a new year, when we're in our traditional Christmas and New Year's break, that we should not take the foot off the accelerator as such but that we should turn to God and rekindle our relationship with Him. So often during the year, we have the best intents, but busyness and everything takes us over. Yet now, while the days are long and warm and we have time, we should choose to spend our mornings or our evenings or whatever it is with God. So let's get into the message now that God has for us today from Psalm 5 at the start of a new year. Two points. Firstly, worship. I believe that worship can be a highly misunderstood thing. When I was young, I totally didn't get it at all. I sat through many, many church services with people singing. I didn't understand what was going on. But then when I was 15, I was over in Mexico on a youth mission trip, and I had an experience of God through music, through that time of worship that I'd never had before. We were worshipping God and I had my hands and I just totally understood it. I got what it was about, that connection with God through music. And I loved to worship God through music after that. I would do it in my room. When everyone had gone out, I'd put some music on and just lie there in the lounge. I would do it on a Sunday or a midweek Christian concert. I would seek out opportunities to worship God whenever that musical sphere was facilitated. I even did it on the street corner sometimes just to show God that I was always committed to him and that I wouldn't be afraid to worship him in front of other people. And in hindsight, I wonder what it was like for people who drove past, maybe people I knew at school. And then at youth group, I remember having a conversation once um, where we were talking about what Friday nights were going to be like and I was such a strong advocate for music because I was absolutely convinced having had this experience that this experience would be universal for everybody else. That when people would come into a worship service that they would experience God and fall down before him and want to change their lives. And I'd ex assumed that this experience would be universal for everybody. And I totally forgot that there was once a time in which I hadn't actually had that experience. But now I seldom feel the same kind of overwhelming experience that I did when I was a teenager. 
when worshipping God through music. And sure, I still do from time to time have some sort of connection and some feeling when I'm doing that, especially when I'm leading others into God's presence on a Sunday morning. I can feel the spirit moving and flowing. But it's not as strong emotionally, per se, as when I was a teenager. And I put that down to necessity in one regard. I think God knew as a teenager I needed to have an experience of him. I needed for this thing that was once dull and lifeless to come alive and be really exciting and to refresh the sense of who God was in my life. But also, to be honest, I think sometimes as a teenager, we just feel things a lot more strongly than we do as adults. So I've changed a lot as well. But here's the point. Worship can be really great. We can have an experience of God through it. Absolutely. That's a given. But we can also have a relationship with God without music. That's also a given. We can experience God on the mountaintop, in the bush, on the water, catching up with a friend, or just in the stillness and quietness, or even in the middle of the busyness, or when we're seeing something artistic that draws this sense of awe from within us, that we need to get it out somehow through worship. We can worship the creator behind it all when we feel those moments of awe. But worship is not just about a one-off experience or a series of one-off experiences. It's rather the grand sum of our whole lives in service to God. And Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And the Apostle Paul says that the presentation of our whole selves to God is our spiritual worship. He doesn't even mention music or singing or anything like that. So firstly, worship is about our whole lives, not just about music. And secondly, worship is not there for our soul enjoyment or to receive something from God per se. Worship is a response to what God has given us, to what he's done for us. And to who he is. It's not just a moment in time to come to him and to be rekindled in our affections toward him and him for us. It can be that, but it's not just that. And I had a conversation with someone recently about Sunday mornings, what the whole point of them was. And I said that they're there for us to come together, to celebrate that which God has been doing doing during the week. To have a time of community with each other in the moment. And to send each other out into the week ahead ready to go and continue to fulfill the plans that God has for us. Refreshed, refueled, and recommissioned. And I said that Sunday mornings are not primarily there so that people can connect with God. I said that connection with God should happen throughout the week and that that time together should just add to that, not be uh, a substitute for it. But here's the point. I'm not saying that Sunday worship services aren't there to help facilitate a relationship with God. I'm just saying that they're kind of like the icing on the cake. If you have cake and you don't have icing, something's missing. But if you have icing and no cake, it is sickly sweet and it has no substance whatsoever. But if you pair good icing with a good cake, both are vastly improved. So worship is not just about music. It's not just for our enjoyment, but thirdly, worship is good for us. You see, Romans 12 that we read a moment ago, it carries on in Romans 12 verse verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, there's a bit of a myth going around, especially in very biblical circles, such as some types of churches that esteem the word of God above everything else, which is good, but who sometimes think that the Bible needs to be taken at face value, rather than understanding the context in which it was written, or the meaning behind it. Sometimes they see verses that talk about God's glory, and they just they take it very literally without understanding the purpose, why a person would have written about God's glory, and elevate it to some sort of almost mythical thing around which everything resolves, revolves, God's glory. And sometimes it can be a little bit difficult because you'll ask a very real question like, why should we worship? And instead of getting a practical answer, 
with a whole lot of points around why we should worship. You just get kind of a, like a pocket answer, which says, we worship for God's glory. And like, you're meant to be satisfied with that. And you're not meant to go any further to try and understand it. It's just this thing, for God's glory. Now, this in itself is not untrue. We do worship to glorify God. But it's a very limited response to something that has so much more depth than we just do it because we do it. And I think that the key difference that people with that kind of really basic and rigid worldview can have versus the one that we have here at The Journey and many other church um, congregations is that proponents of that kind of thinking believe in a God-centered worldview for the sake of God's glory. And we too believe in a God-centered worldview, but with a key difference. We believe in a God-centered worldview for our sake. Now, just hear me out here. This may ring alarm bells if you don't take the time to understand what I'm saying. You might say, oh, we need to be God-centered. Absolutely, we need to be God-centered. That's absolutely true. We believe that God, that man needs to be God-centered. But we believe that God is other-centered. He didn't just do things for the sake of his own glory. He did it because he has this love that he wants to share with other people. And so he gives out. And we respond to him making everything about him because it is best for us. That's why we put him first. But we put him first because it's best for us. Not because God wants to preserve his glory for his own sake. It, like just this abstract, arbitrary thing like some colossal and universal egotistical ambition of his. So we worship God with lives that are centered around him because this results in the transformation of our minds. So we become people who respond to his other centered love in worship. That is, as Romans 12 says, in reasonable service to God. We know that God has done everything for us. So we respond by doing everything that God asks, knowing that it will work out for our best in the end. So firstly, worship is, not, is about our whole lives, not just about music. Secondly, it's not just about our enjoyment, but it's about responding to God's love. And thirdly, worship is good for us. God wants us to worship him, not for the sake of some arbitrary glory, but because he knows that if we have God-centered lives, it will benefit us and the world around us immensely. So firstly, worship, and secondly, meditation. Coming back to the psalm, David writes in verse 3, O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you, and I watch. Now, sacrifices are an Old Testament ideal. As we've talked about before, we do not need to make sacrifices in order to please God or to twist his metaphorical arm. Old Testament sacrifices looked forward to the coming of Jesus. Whereas New Testament Christians stand upon the finished work of the cross, the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. We know that God loves us and we do not need to make temporal sacrifices in order to be heard by God. We don't try and manipulate God by saying, hey, I'm going to sacrifice this if you do this for me. Rather, as we've already discussed this morning, our whole lives are a sacrifice to God. We respond to God and his love and everything he's done for us in reasonable service toward him. We no longer give a tenth of what we have, for example. We no longer sacrifice our first or our best, but rather we give everything we have as a response to the fact that God loves us and wants the best for us. So our lives are totally his. And we live God-centered lives full of worship for our creator and king. Now the rest of the psalm compares those who delight in wickedness, in verse 4, who speak lies, in verse 6, with those who are godly. Verse 11, but let all who, refu who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with a favor as with a shield. It talks as the Old Testament and Psalms often do about meditating on good things rather than on evil. Why is this? It's because God promises to protect those who do so 
and cover them with favor. Again, this reminds me of Romans 12 too, which we've just read. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So this year, let us be worshippers of God, not because we care about some sort of arbitrary glory, but because it reminds us that we are blessed. When we come to God and worship him, it reminds us that we are blessed, that he is other-centered and that we receive from him. It reminds us that we're created and that our creator has good plans and purposes for us. And let us meditate solely upon the word of God and the promises of God. Let us not fall into temptation to do things that are unholy or wicked, but let us trust God no matter what. So how should we live our lives this year in light of the psalm and these points about worship and meditation? Firstly, let us come to God daily in remembrance of who he is. We're going to take communion in a moment. And communion is a great reminder of who God is and what he has done for us. And that some church congregations only take it once a month is quite frankly ridiculous to me. It seems to undermine the whole point of the institution. You see, we're meant to gather and celebrate communion every time we uh, gather together and remember God. In Acts 20 verse 7, it's mentioned that the believers gathered on the first day of the week to break bread. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, it says. And in Acts 2.42, It is mentioned as one of the key things that the believers devoted themselves to. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So this year and today in particular, as we take the bread and the cup, why don't you remember who God is and what he's done in the person of his son, Jesus, as well as who you are in light of that fact. Dwell for a moment upon how he gave his all so that your life could be an act of worship in response as reasonable service to him. That because you're loved, you can love with everything that you have. And as you leave this place today, why don't you consider what changes you can make in your life to be able to meditate more upon who God is and upon his word. Perhaps you could start off your day with a moment before God reading the Bible and praying, or you could listen to the word as you begin your daily commute. Whatever it is, make this year a year of worship and meditation to God. Think about godly things rather than worldly things. And I guarantee this time next year, you will be so glad that you did. And I want to finish with this final verses of this fifth Psalm, verses 11 to 12. But let all take refuge in you, Let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favor as with a shield.